Welcome to another edition of the Sim Racing Garage. I'm Barry Rowland. In this episode, we'll be reviewing the H2 motion platform from the guys at DOF Reality, with several improvements being made from when I reviewed DOF Reality's M2 seat mover platform a few months ago. Time to put it through the SRG review process and see how it does. So, let's get to it. So now let's take a closer look at the motor assembly for this H2 platform. Now, these are new motors and the transmissions or the gearboxes are different also. They changed the supplier of the motors they had and they've changed the type of motor they're using here. Now, I did do a review on the DOF Reality M2 platform a few months back and yeah, that wasn't the most smooth moving platform as you could see from the video if you watch that review. Now, these motors are different. Not, not only are they different, but they're sourced from a different supplier too, according to DOF Reality. Now, the previous motors on the M2 that I had in that review were actually a 3000 RPM motor. These motors are 1500 RPM motors. So that's going to be a little bit different as far as the reaction. It was probably going to translate a little better from the jerkiness that we saw in the other review. At least we're hoping it is. And also, the gearbox up here is a different ratio. These are at 1 to 25, and the gearboxes on the M2 motors were actually 1 to 50. Now, how that, again, is going to translate to the motion, I don't know. We're just going to have to wait and find out. But one thing that is good here is if you... If, I'm going to show you a clip here from that review on the M2, and that's me moving these levers right here. All right? So here we are moving the levers, and you can see how much play we have in that connection there inside the gearbox. And that's play. I, I wouldn't call that lash. You know, it, it's definitely play. And I think that contributed to the jerky movements of that unit. Now here, I'm going to give you a close-up over here. I'm actually moving the same. Brace this a little. And I'm actually going to move it up and down. So that's what we have here. So you can see there's a, hardly any play at all. In fact, I wouldn't call that play. I would call that lash. And you've got to have some lash in these gears internally in the gearbox or you're just going to grind them to pieces when you start using it. So this is what I would call lash, and it feels proper to me. And both of these levers on both sides, let's spin this around here. I'm going the wrong way. Try this way, Barry. There we go. Both of these are the same. So that's a good, that's really good. I like the way that's, that's done now. So it should give us an improvement in the actual movement. And you also, while we have this over here, you see these plates over here on the sides. They have some couplers that are connected to the shaft that's inside the gearbox. And the end of this coupler has a rotary sensor in it so that it can obviously tell what position that, this le that the lever is going to be in and tell the software and the controllers and all that what to do as far as moving our platform. So let's spin this back around. All right. So this unit is on a metal plate, or not a metal plate, but a metal frame, and it's all welded up in here. Uh, the usual stuff that we see from DOF Reality, and I'm going to start building this frame up, and as I do, I'll do the usual, show you the part as we're putting it on, and then show you what bolts I'm using to cinch it down. And what we're going to do first, uh, next, is get to the side rails of the bottom of this frame, and go ahead and mount this platform on those side rails, and start forming the whole thing up and putting it together. Here are the bottom frame rails that are going to be going onto this assembly. And these are 20 millimeter by 20 millimeter square tubing units. And we've got some welds wherever you see a joint. And the welds are done pretty well, actually. They did a good job grinding them down. And yeah, I think you can't complain about that. It's a pretty neat job. We've got these nylon pieces in the, in the back here. And it's got some kind of a crinkle finish on it, similar to what's on this frame down here. I think it might be some kind of a powder coating. I don't think it's paint, because it just doesn't feel like paint. It doesn't smell like paint. <laughs> so yeah, we've got two holes on the top that's going to hold a cross member, and we'll get to that once we get these mounted to the sides. And we have two holes on the sides here, as you can see, right there. And they're going to go to these holes down here on this plate that's holding our motors. And we have a little flange hanging out on the side here. Pretty easy to put this stuff on. I'm not going to spend too much time with it. We get this little bag of bolts. I've already poured them out, most of them anyway. It says frame in it, so I'm assuming that's for the frame. <laughs> so we're going to be using these socket head cap bolts, stainless steel units. These are M8s, 35 millimeters long, and we have a 6 millimeter wrench size or drive bit size on the end of them. We also are going to be using a washer 
and a nylon safety type nut or anti-vibration nut. You can see the nylon that's in there. And once we have that tightened down, it should not come off. And we just have a little M8 washer that we'll be using on the inside. Very simple to do this. Just need to get our holes lined up, obviously, the biggest thing. So I'm going to kind of look down here as I slide it in. And that's pretty close, but I need to come forward with it, I think, a little bit. And a lot of times I'll just put a bolt in there and kind of move it around a little bit until I can get it to go in. Easy as that. And, of course, we're going to put our washer and nut on the other side. I'm just going to get this finger tight. We're not going to tighten any of this down. And you can see I've already got the one attached over here. It's pretty loose. But I want it loose until I get all the parts of this frame assembled. Then I can cinch everything down tight. Because if you don't do that and try to tighten one up first, it, before you uh, have everything mounted, it can be a bit of an issue. Right, so let's go ahead and get this rear one in. which should be already lined up, and it is. Now it's just a matter of getting one more nut on there. Just like that. And again, I'm not going to tighten that down until we get our cross member set up, which will be our next segment, the cross member. Now we're going to be mounting the cross member. Now this is a large unit, very heavy duty feeling. It is a hollow square tube. It's 60 millimeters across and 30 millimeters high. We have some L type of flanges built into this or welded in. I don't know if you can actually see the welds. There's some welds. I think you see those there. Again, ground down quite nicely before they put the coating on it. But yeah, that's going to kind of sit on top and also on the sides here with this L bracket looking thing. And we have two holes here. We have two holes for the universal joint that we'll get to that in a minute. And remember, we've got two sets of holes on the top of these side support rails here. And that's so that we can, once we mount this, we can actually move it from one set of holes to the other. Not very far, uh, half inch, 18 mil, something like that. Not much at all as far as moving them from side to side. And I'm going to move it. Now, the front of the frame is that way towards the gearboxes on the motor. So that's where our pedals and everything will be over there. So I'm going to actually mount that towards the rear first. So if I have a balance problem, I can got a little bit of flexibility to be able to move it up there. But hopefully we won't have any of those issues. And just like attaching these side rails, we're going to be using these socket head cap bolts, these M8s, stainless steel, and they have an uh, rather a M6 driver size on the top. They're 35 millimeters long. And we'll be using another nylon safety nut and another washer. Very simple. Just drop it in. Again, this is why we have it loose so we can wiggle things around. So I'm just going to kind of drop that bolt in there. I'm going to give you another one just to keep things straight while I'll drop the other one in. There we go. So now it's just a matter of getting our washer on the bottom and just I'm going to get these again finger tight. I don't think there's anything else that we're going to be mounting to this frame. So I think I can once I get this done, I can actually at the point then to where I can go ahead and tighten everything down because it's just going to be the universal joint going on the top of this cross member, which we'll get to on our next segment. So let me go ahead and just get these on. And yeah, so yeah, pretty simple stuff. Really easy to assemble this. I like that. I mean, there is some hardware, obviously. You're going to have to pay attention as you go along. But yeah, I mean, it's pretty simple stuff. And yeah, what we'll do next is take a look at that universal bracket and mount it on top of this bar. So the universal joint looks like this. Actually, it's a universal joint bracket with a universal joint in the middle. You can see the universal joint in there. And it's kind of greasy, which is good. We want a lot of grease in there. Doesn't look like anything special, just your usual needle bearing type of universal joint in here. Now we have four plates. They all look the same to me. I actually measured them out and they're, they're the same dimensions. So there's really not a, this is the top and this is the bottom as far as I can tell. And it, when you think about it, it probably shouldn't matter. So what we're going to do is attach this. But when we take these bolts out, the reason this, this is shipped with the bolts in there, these plates will come off the ends of this bearing if you're not careful, right? The cups in this bearing here will come off. So I'm going to actually try to, let's see if I can get this to work. I'm going to take one out first and then kind of keep my hand on it while I'm taking the other one out. I'm hoping that's going to work and have my bolts ready to go because we're going to slide the bolts into these two holes, obviously, in our cross member up here. So let's see how this works. I don't mind if they fall this way. I just don't want them to come off. So let me try see what happens there. They might. There you go. See, one of them fell over. All right. So I'm going to try to keep both of these cups in, like pressure on them like that, as I kind of get this thing lined up. 
So I'm going to go over here, get one of my bolts, and kind of just slide this down. As I'm sliding it down, I'll feed the bolt through and see if I can get it to go through the other side without too much drama. So I got the bolt on the other side, and I'm going to move my hand a little bit so I can see what's going on. And there we have one bolt in. And usually when you have one in, the other one's not too difficult to get it to follow. As he says that he can't do it. Now, there we go. All right. So now we have both of the bolts in. We can go in with our washers and nuts that we just took off. And again, these are the same nylon safety or anti-vibration nuts that we've seen so far throughout this build. And there we have it. So there it goes. So now we can actually go back this way and we can go sideways and we can go all around in a motion like this. So that's what that universal joint's doing for us, in case you guys aren't experienced with those things. Same things we have in drive lines in our torque tubes or drive shafts, as we say in North America. So yeah, working good here. I think this is going to be great. So really, what we're going to do is, I've already got the, the bottom frame all tightened up, because the reason I did that is because there's nothing else being mounted on this part of the frame or this cross member. This is the only thing that's going to be holding the rest of it. And we're going to be putting this really long bar that's part of the main frame, a longitudinal bar that goes this way across the frame. But we'll see that in the next segment. And we're going to attach that to this. So we'll see how that goes in the next segment. So this is the longitudinal center bar that all of everything is going to mount to this bar. As far as the pedal tray is going to come out on the bottom here this way. We're going to be mounting our seat brackets across this and also the brackets coming across to attach to our motors on our little rod ends here. A little connect, it'll connect us to the levers on those motors and any peripherals that we're going to be putting on here. And of course, we're going to be mounting this to the universal joint over here. Now, the universal joint, remember, they got the two bolts up here. And there's a series of holes in here. Actually, we have five holes. So we have two bolts, five holes. That means we've got three possible positions. Now, the centers on these holes are 20 millimeter. So we can move this three times or in three places, 20 millimeters. I kind of set it up here to show you that. So I can move this. Let's see, that would be the first set of holes would be there. And then we got the second set and then the third set. So 20 millimeters on each set of holes moving this sideways or rather front to back, not sideways. Now what I'm going to do here is try to show you how I'm going to do this. <laughs> I'm trying to think of better, the best way to do it as I'm going here. Remember, these two plates are independent, just like we, if you saw when I've attached this. So they're going to flop around when I take these bolts out, right? And the bolts have to go through these holes in this bar. So might as well just go ahead and get it done, right? Quit whining about it and just do it. <laughs> so again, I don't want these plates to come off sideways. I don't want the nuts to get away either. So there we go. Oh, that's nice. It kind of just sits there. <laughs> that's a surprise. So I don't want these to fall off this way, you know, sideways, because these the, they're attached to the cups on this universal joint bearing in here. So I'm just going to kind of leave them straight up and down like that. And maybe, just maybe, I can set this up here. Let me turn this a little bit that way. And just put the bolt through the flange here, through the bar, and through the other side over there, all in one move. Now, I'm still, I'm just going to put this in the center location, or the center most location set of holes and see how that goes. Well, we can always move it later. But then again, everything I was doing was going back. I'm just going to go with the center. I don't know. I can't make my mind up. <laughs> so I'm going to kind of pull this up. Side, you know, the, it's kind of tight here. It won't just fall in between them. So I'm going to have to move this out just a little bit off that bearing. You know, the cap in here, I'm just pulling it towards me a little bit. And there you go. Looks like it's going to go through. It's going to let me slide in there now. Nice and easy. And we'll go ahead and get one bolt started. And my flange over here has moved a little bit. I'm going to twist it back. Trying to get it lined up with what I can see this bracket is doing. And there we go. Oh, that was too easy, huh? So now I'm just going to try to get the other one. While I'm, while I'm lucky, I'm going to see if I can stretch it all the way through. And there we go. How about that? <laughs> all right. So now, of course, just a matter of doing just like we've done so far. We're putting one washer and one nylon safety nut on each one of these bolts. Easy enough. Get them finger tight. And I can go ahead and tighten this down because, well, 
uh, I'm not going to be moving it because we're not going to know what the weight balance is going to be on this as far as center of gravity until we actually get everything on here and you're sitting in it. So, it's, you know, if I have to take it off, it really doesn't matter where it is now. But I'm going to go ahead and cinch these down tight. So this will be tight. So here, now you can see this is where we're getting our movement. I'm going to go ahead and turn it back around this way. There we go. Now, it'll go up and down like this. We can twist sideways for our roll. So we got a roll on our pitch. And it can kind of, you know, do it all at once at certain angles. Like I had over there, and it can actually angle. If we can roll over that far, it can still go up and down in that angle. So we got a lot of, a lot of room here as far as the angles on this. So here's the rod end assembly that we're going to be using to attach everything together so we have movement. And we have one of these rod ends is going to be attached to our lever over here in the front hole. And we have the other side that's going to be attached up here to our cross member. Okay, they call this a lateral cross member, front lateral bar. <laughs> so that's going to be the, connect the connector that does this. Very simple to put this on. You get two washers in here. It comes pre-assembled. What did you see here? I didn't put this together. So you got two, a couple of washers here. We've got a lock washer underneath there. And we have the 17 millimeter nylon safety nuts. And we have an M10 bolt socket head cap with an M8 wrench size on the end of it. And it's a simple matter of pulling this stuff off. You pull the nut off. Usually I'll put the nut on the inside. I guess it really doesn't matter. It's just an aesthetic thing for me. I'm going to pull all this out and set that aside. So now I have the bolt and the two washers. We have to take those off. I'm going to take one washer and the lock washer off. All right. Oops. You see that there? And go ahead and put my bolt in. And it's a little tight. And if it is tight, just kind of screw it a little bit as it goes in, and it usually will feed all the way in, right? Okay, so that's how, how we're going to be bolting this in. So let's go ahead and do it. And remember, I got a washer, one washer on there already. There it goes in a little easier the second time that I did that. So now it's very loose, as you might imagine. I'm kind of just let this fall over the side there, get my nut ready. And now I'm going to put a washer on, and then I'll put this spring lock washer on top of that. And then we'll come back in with our M10 nut and screw it in far enough to hit the nylon where you can't screw it in anymore. Just finger tight. And then I'll have it up here ready to go on the top one. Right? So that was easy. Not hard to attach that, but I'm not going to attach the top one for right now. And the reason I'm not going to attach the top one right now is I have another bracket assembly we're going to be putting on here. Where are my brackets? There they are. Because we're going to be using some dampers on this system. All right, this is the brackets that, are, that we use, and I'll show you how the damper goes on on the back of this shaft down here, all right? And it's going to also attach off this bracket because this is going to be, the bracket's going to go in here like this, right? So that we have a hole hanging off of here to attach our other part of our damper. But we'll see that when we get to the damper section. We are going to be using a damper unit on both of these motors to try and smooth out some of the motion or the motion that these motors are delivering. Now, if you watched my M2 review, you could see it was kind of a jerky motion going on there. And these dampeners were thought as an idea to help lessen some of that or minimize it. And it did help on the M2, but the M2 also had the 3000 RPM motors, which are moving quicker. And we also have the lash or the play that was in the gearboxes on those motors on that M2 were a lot more than they are on these as we saw if you've been watching the video so far in these motors or the or rather the gearboxes on these motors. So we may not even need these but I'm going to put this on at the minimum setting and of course they're just a, a steering wheel dampener for a motorcycle. So you pull it in and out like that and it just helps motorcycles stay stable at high speeds on the front steering. And doesn't take much effort to actually move this, so it's not going to add too much to this on the minimum setting. But of course, we can actually turn this valve here. It's got a little valve there, valve dial or knob. And the more we turn it clockwise, it screws in a valve that's internal to this and closes down the orifice or the hole or whatever it's in to limit how fast that fluid can travel through it. And you can see, I can feel it's already getting stiffer when I did that. So when we loosen it, it backs that piece out of the valve and opens that hole up or orifice or whatever they have in there so it's easier to slide it, right?
Pretty simple stuff. Now, you can buy this at DOF Reality. They have them for, I think it's $100 for a set of these. Or you can go on eBay and get them cheaper. I think I found uh, a quick search uh, right here. You can see that it actually showed it uh, around $30, $34, something like that in between there. Different ones cost a little bit more or less than the others. But they all look pretty much the same as these do. Right. You also get a bracket that goes on to the housing here, right? And it has a rod end in it, just like the bottom has a rod end in it with a bushing there, a little brass bushing. So everything can move around and not bind up. And we're going to attach this piece to the top of this, right? This bracket, along with the eye, or rather the rod, the eye of this rod in assembly all together, right? And there was a, a bracket. I'm going to show you how I, how I, I used a bracket to do that. And they actually include these brackets here. Go ahead and put this down. And I'll put it up here. But I did, this is a little steel bracket, same finish that's on everything else. I did have to open this hole up a bit because it's an M10 bolt that goes into these rod ends. And I just had to open it up a little bit. You can see it's kind of shiny in there because the hole was the same size as this one. An M10 just wouldn't go through that. But no big deal. Just drill it out a little bit and you're done. So this is going to go up here like this with the M10 that I drilled out on here on the inside. Then we'll have the rod end coming up and attaching there, just like that. Then we'll have a hole here to attach our bracket that's on top of that damper over there. Okay, simple, right? So what I'm going to do is go ahead and attach this first to the top here. All right, so I'm going to get my bracket behind there. And I'm going to use the bolt with a washer. This is our M10 bolt that goes into the rod end tops, just like we saw before. Just put that in the rod end, little eyelet there. And then we'll get our bracket to go on there. If I can get my hands right here. Okay, bracket's on. And the bracket hole will be sticking out towards the rear there, like that. We'll go ahead and slide everything in. And the hole on this bracket here is also pretty tight. Might be this powder coating they're using, but you can see I can kind of screw it and it goes right in. Okay. So then we'll go on to the other side just like we normally would do and put our washer, a spring lock nut on. And this is kind of like a double lock thing. And of course, our nylon safety nut, which is a 17 mil. And we'll secure it that way. Of course, we'll rotate our bracket back to the rear, make sure that stays where it's supposed to. And now we're ready to attach this rod into the bottom down here. All right. So I'll move over here. Let you guys see that. Again, I've got the washer on that M10 bolt. Slides right in like that. And then we go ahead and put our lock washer, or rather, rather washer than lock washer. There you go. Get it right, Barry. And then we'll go ahead and snug it. I'm just going to finger tighten this up right now. Now, we have to get the bottom. Go ahead and take this top bracket. Actually, I am going to take this top bracket and leave it off. And we're going to have to get this bottom attached to the end down here. Okay. So I need to take that screw out. I've already loosened it up, so I think I can. Yeah, there we go. I can just spin this off. And it's not a very long screw, even though the hole in here I've already checked is longer. So you can see it's a pretty short looking M6 screw here. It's got a big flange on it. But I was able to source these flathead Phillips that are also M6 that will fit right in there. And because it's a flathead, it won't go through, right? And we still have enough thread on the other side here to go inside the shaft, the hollow part of this gear shaft or gear shaft is coming out of the motor and just attach it. Very simple, really. So we'll go ahead and do that. And I'm going to actually, I almost did it wrong. I'm going to attach this the other way. I'm just going to see how this valve is. I want the valve going towards the back of the rig, all right? Because I don't want any possibility of fouling up with that linkage there. So I'm just going to spin this around, which you can do on these pretty easy. And then we'll just go ahead and put it in that way. Glad I saw that. Now I have to take it all the way off again. Sometimes when you're doing video and talking, you forget what you're looking at. <laughs> and it's, uh, you forget what's going on. There we go. And we'll torque that down pretty good. There we go. And now our valve is in the rear. And of course, you can see it sticks up pretty high. You can see the other one back over there. I'm going to go ahead and bottom it out when I make this attachment. 
So now it's just a matter of putting this clamp on there, right? And it has its own bolt and it comes with it out of the box. It will cinch the clamp tightly around the tube here, the main tube. So let's go ahead and slide that down with the eye pointing that way, like so. And of course, we're just going to be able to move this to get aligned with our hole up here, right? So once we're aligned with that hole, then we can put our bolt in. But one consideration here, first off, I had to source, they didn't have an M8 bolt that would be long enough to go through that and still attach everything. Cause you know, we've got to compensate for the width of this rod end piece up here. So I got these bolts, but now there's also another issue <laughs> that we cured by, there we go, adding a couple of washers on the other side of this bracket. The problem is this, when this whole, when we get to there and we run this bolt through here, there's an interference with this bracket on the curved part of this bracket, okay, on here. So what I did was just go ahead and put the bolt in like this, right? And I'll space it out with a couple of washers. That's all the space I need right there. So I'll put a couple of washers in it. And I still got plenty of room on the other side for a nut. And then I'll just line it up, push it through, and then I'll go ahead and go get my nut, my nut, not a knot. And again, these are the nylon safety type nuts. Go ahead and run that on there like that. And there we go. So then now that I have this where I want it, I can actually go in and tighten this up and clamp everything down. Now that I have everything assembled here, we can go in and tighten all this assembly down and it'll be ready to go. So yeah, go ahead and get that tight. So there we have it. And now when this thing goes up and down, we can actually adjust how much dampening we have based on the motion we're getting on our valve down here. So yeah, this is actually pretty trick. I don't know if really it's necessary on this system because of the new motors and the gearbox that we talked about before, but you know, it wouldn't hurt. And if I think it's, it's doing something that I don't like, then yeah, I'll just take it back off easy enough. So yeah, we'll get to the next segment. Okay, I'm gonna put a couple of different sections on it in one segment here. The wheelbase holders that are gonna actually hold the wheelbase uprights and our seat bars that we're gonna be putting on the bottom. Now the seat bars, you can see, have a lot of holes in them. We have a pair, of, actually a set of three on each end. Then we have another one here, here, and then for the centers. Now the centers are actually for mounting the seat, to these seat bars over here to this section, right? The main section. So one's gonna sit there. Then one's gonna sit back over here, all right? And we've got these long three inch bolts that we're going to need because these are 20 millimeters. Then we have another 30 millimeters there, plus the nuts and everything. It's, it's uh, going to make it so it, it fits. And we still have enough thread on the bottom to get our nuts on. Simple enough. So let's go ahead and put that one in and this one. And I'm probably not going to tighten these all the way down because we still have to put our seat brackets to these things or on these things. And I'm not sure how well that's going to go and I might need to wiggle them around a little bit if you know what I mean. So again, a washer and a nut. Again, all these are the safety nuts that we've been seeing throughout this assembly process. Pretty quick and easy to do this. We'll do one more after this, and then we can get on to these upright brace bars, I guess you could call them. I'm not sure, <laughs> but we know what they're doing. Now, you have to mount these in a staggered position. You can't mount them like this because these pieces out here, over here and over here, if you can see that, you know, right here and here, they need to be staggered. So we stagger them so that the front hole on one bar is further, is actually in line with the rear hole on the other bar. So this will give us a stagger in the front here. So when we come in and put these upright pieces at one, they'll have some separation and then the wheelbase is supposed to tile that in. So we'll see how that goes. But again, pretty simple to put these on. Just gonna get two bolts in each one of these. And of course, we're gonna do the same thing with our washers and safety nuts on the bottom of each one of these. This goes pretty quick once you get to a certain point because we had to do things with the motor linkages and things like that. And also had to go in the software 
and switch the motor levels or levers around because they were 180 degrees out of line of where I needed them to be to make this work properly. All right, so there we have it. And again, we're going to leave this stuff loose because I'm still going to be coming in here and mounting the wheelbase uprights, and we still have to put our pedal tray on. But beyond that, you know, we're getting real close here to being done with this as far as the basic chassis build and then we'll be putting the seat and stuff on and getting to those things and then we can actually run it and that'll be fun yeah now we can put the wheelbase upright pieces on and these consist of a kind of a bent bar going on here of course we have welds here and here and we have a, a lot of holes a series of holes down this part we've got a couple of holes on the top also here and i'll give you a close-up of that so that's for where the wheel deck is going to be mounted once we have the, these affixed. Now, simple enough, we're going to be putting in these holes down here. And I already have the bolts that are going to be long enough to do that. And I'm just going to go ahead and put these in. I'm going to, here's the thing with this. And you can see it right away. It's probably not going to be the most robust type of wheel mount, a uh, wheel base. But we'll see once we get it all bolted up. But the lower you go with this, as far as mounting this in the, the bracket that we already put on in the last segment, the stronger the wheelbase is going to be. But I'm going to have a seat sitting over here, so the, you know the seat's going to be this high. Yeah, this I'm going to go ahead and put it at the very top. I mean, that's, that's probably where I'm going to need it. So I'll go ahead and put two of my bolts in there. And just like we've done all throughout this video, we put in the washer behind that, and we'll put in our nylon safety or lock nut on there and secure those two and of course we're not going to secure these down really tight yet because we're going to want to put that wheelbase plate actually the actual mount plate that's going to be mounted to the top of this and tie these two together so we want it to be a little bit loose for that and then we'll tighten everything down once we get to that point so we'll go over and go to the other side here and this is going to be a staggered mount that supposedly is going to give us some strength in how this wheelbase is mounted. But there's only one way to find out, obviously, and that's to get this together and get it done. One more washer and a nut, and it won't be going anywhere. So now we have this up here to deal with. And when we come back, I'll have the plate that goes on top of this that's actually going to be receiving our wheelbase and actually sitting on that. And you can see they're kind of drooping towards each other now. But once we get all this tightened up, this should come out level. At least I'm hoping it will. So when we get back, we'll be putting the top plate on. The wheel deck is mounted. And not really mounted. I just got the screw sitting in it. And yeah, uh, I wanted to show you something here before I put the bolts on. Or rather not the bolts, but the nuts and the washers. I'm going to pull one of these out of here. These, what they give us for this is these Phillips head stainless steel screws. All right. Screws themselves are nice enough, and they do have a flat head on them, so they're flat. The thing is, there's no counter bore in this. All right. So that means that when we put this in, as you can see from these, they're going to sit proud of the actual surface right here. So he's going to be sticking up a little bit. So that means when you mount your wheel, you're going to want to put some washers on that wheel base. So when it comes, when you screw it down and, and tighten it down, it doesn't sit on top of these screws. Which I suppose it could do that, but I wouldn't want it because you know it's going to mar the bottom of your wheelbase up. You know if if it moves at all, or you know it's just why well, run the risk when you don't have to. I'm going to go ahead and put these washers and nuts on here so that we can keep it from taunting me that it's going to fly off. <laughs> So let me get a couple of these on and we'll be all right. So again, it's not real a, a real problem, but I would have liked to seen some counter bores on here so that it would be flush. All right, with the, with the top here. I mean, it's a pretty common thing that we see in the industry of people or companies doing that as far as, you know, putting the counter bores in a plate. But this plate itself just is not thick enough for that. It's just too thin. Again, which gives me concerns about how hefty of a wheelbase we can put on this. You know, from the looks of it, of course it's shaky now because I don't have it 
cinched down tightly down at the bottom down there and also up here. And once I get it cinched down, it's going to be stiffer, but still we're talking about 20 millimeter tubes here on these uprights. All right. And they're going all the way down that we saw before in another segment where they connect down there. And even when I get it all tightened up, I just don't have a lot of confidence that this is like a direct drive wheel capable wheelbase with the, uh, the high torque levels that those wheelbases are capable of. Chances are we're going to run into problems with it moving around on us and losing the fidelity or some fidelity because it'll be like a dampening effect when we're moving it. But I can't say for sure, but we'll see that obviously once I'm in it and driving this rig and yeah, we'll be able to tell better then. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and tighten all this down. The only thing we got left to do on this frame before we start putting a seat and the wheel and everything on it is we need to put a pedal tray on it. And when we come back, we'll finish up with that pedal tray setting. So now it's time to put the pedal plate on and it's got the same thickness of steel that is on the wheel plate. We've got a couple of L brackets underneath there, very thick steel here and nice welding job on the bottom of the plate. And we've got some holes here that we're going to be using to attach it with. And you can see we've got a front hole here and that's so that we can mount it to this hole in the bracket. And then we have the adjustment for angle on the other holes that you see there. Simple enough. I'm going to go ahead and take a bolt. And these are the super long bolts that go in there, about four inches long. And just kind of set it here and kind of line it up by eye. I'm looking straight down on it now, trying to find out where the hole is. And there it is. Go ahead and get the bolt. And you can see it came through on the other side pretty easily. I'm probably going to be running a Thrustmaster set. So I'm going to go with this second hole from the top. Actually, it's the third hole, second hole from the bottom. And go ahead and see if we can get that to go in. There we go. So now we've got these bolts in. We can come back with our washers, slap those on with our nuts, our little, the usual nuts that we're using all the way through this build. Some 13 mils. All right. And go ahead and put our other washer on, our other nut. And we should be good to go here. And that's how it works. All right, so there we have it, easy enough. Of course, I'm going to cinch it down tightly. We've got the, if you can see the bottom parts down here of this wheel mount, we've had that nice and tight now. It's actually coming together pretty well. A, a stiffer than I, I assumed it would be, especially on this wheel base mount. But then again, the proof's in the pudding, as they say, and we won't be able to get that proof until we're actually in this cockpit and doing some driving with the motion going on. And I think, I'm, like I said, I'm going to run a Thrustmaster wheel on this and a Thrustmaster pedal set. But we'll see that once we get it all mounted. Now we've got to put the seat on, get our pedals on and wheel, and then we'll be ready to start doing some driving. And that's going to be some fun. This is the controller box from DOF Reality for the M2 and the one that we're testing today, the H2 chassis. All right. So we only have two plugs because there's only two motors on those. Now I've already opened this box up and showed you the internals in the M2 review. If you want to see what that looks like inside, you can go to that review and take a look at it. No sense in taking it all apart again. Now, the important thing here is knowing where your data plugs and your power plugs are. Of course, these are the power plugs, the big ones on top, and they're three pin units. The controller plugs are down here and they have three pins on them. Get you a little close up there so you can see that. Now, there is a color code here. And if your system comes with two black plugs on the motors for the power, uh, mine came with two black plugs, but the, M the M2 came with a brown plug and a, and a black plug, so you know color-coded which one should be where. But no big deal. The brown plug is actually the left side. When you're sitting in the cockpit, it'll be your left side motor, also known as motor one. The black plug will be motor two or the right side motor. Now, if you do get them mixed up, you know, no big deal. You'll notice that they're not moving in the right direction. Just switch them around and you'll be good to go. We have the power switch up here, of course. That's the mains that is plugged into the back. And you can see we have the USB-B type of plug on the front. And we've got a couple of fans, cooling fans on the top. Right there, you can actually see through it. So we've got some, some good holes back here in the back. And I'll show you that in a second. And on the back itself, we have the mains and a little DC plug over there. All right now that DC plug, let me get you a little closer look there, is for this. You can buy an emergency stop with your system if you want one. So, and it's the typical emergency stop buttons that you see for most any kind of uh, motor system, even on our direct drive wheels, you just press it down to stop and that'll stop all the torque going to the motors. And then we turn it in a clockwise motion to 
release it and it pops back up. Simple enough. And it has a DC end on it here. It just plugs right into this right here. And then you put this somewhere where you can get to it easily and quickly in case you have a problem with your <laughs> with your motion system. Right. So I'll show you the bottom here. And you can actually see the two power slot supplies that are in there, two mean wheel units. It's really a pretty good system inside. Again, go to the M2 uh, review that I did if you want to see the insides of this. Now, I'm also going to do an H3 and an H6 review, but those are different boxes, and I'll probably take those apart just to show you what's inside of those. But yeah, no need to do it here. So now that we have this done, and we got, all we got to do now is go connect everything up and see if we've got our motors going in the right direction and everything looks right, and then we can drive it. So here's the final configuration for this H2 rig. We have the seat mounted now. And of course we have our Thrustmaster wheel and pedal set over there. And I'm gonna go down and show you something here real quick. There is a crossbar that goes on the bottom of this chassis that I did not show you in the actual assembly process. And I wanted to make sure you guys saw this. And I'm gonna give you a little B-roll of it right here. And yeah, it's just uh, two bolts on either side for this bar to be attached to the back of these two lateral rails here. And the only problem I had with this was I did have to chase the threads in these holes because the powder coating had gotten on the threads and yeah, just had to take a tap, a, a 10 millimeter 1.25 tap and just clean up the holes there as you can see. And then yeah, we're good to go, easy to bolt it on. So make sure you don't forget that piece and you'll again, you'll see or have seen segments in here where that was not on there. And I just want to clarify that that bar does need to be on there. <laughs> so anyway, we're using the NRG seat brackets that I had laying around. These are the industry standard side mount brackets as far as the hole spacing on it. So, you know, anything would have worked here, Sparco, OMP or whatever generic brand, as long as the, it has the industry standard race car seat mounting holes in them. And we've got it attached with a couple of bolts there on either side on the back. And of course, we have them also on either side of the front here. See the one way over there. The pedal tray, I did have to drill a couple of holes in this one to fit this Thrustmaster pedal set. The Thrustmaster threaded inserts on the bottom of this set are at 235 millimeters center to center spacing, and there were just no holes to accommodate that. So no big deal, just mark it and drill it, and yeah, just pop them on there. It's not the first time or the last time that you'll ever have to drill holes <laughs> when it comes to building rigs. And again, this is a little bit of flex in this as I expected on this wheelbase mount. And it is a TSPC racer that I've mounted here. So it is the heaviest Thrustmaster wheelbase there is. And we are running the 488 GT wheel that Thrustmaster makes. So it's not the lightest thing to, be, to have on there. But you know, it's not too bad but when you're actually driving, when I'm actually driving it, there you, it's a little bit more noticeable if you're you have a heavy hand on the wheel. But yeah, nothing that's a showstopper for sure. I mean, it, it didn't affect my lap times or anything like that. But yeah, I mean, when you see 20 millimeter tubes like that coming that far up with all those holes drilled in them for adjustments, you know, I'm kind of meeting my expectations for the how rigid this wheel mount is. I mean, it gets the job done. Don't get me wrong. It's just not like it's going to flex off or anything, but yeah, it's, it is what it is when it comes to that. So overall, we're all set up, ready to go. And yeah, now all we got to do is get in and take a look at the, the software app that controls this, that we're going to be using control. But I'm, gonna use, I'm not going to use SimTools. I'm going to use the Sim Racing Studios app, which is a very, very nice app to use, especially if you've ever used SimTools before, you will know what I mean. So we'll get to that segment next. So here is the Sim Racing Studio DOF Reality interface which is much simpler and easier to use than the sim tools that some others use for motion simulation. This is definitely an easier way to go. First off, in the motion tab, you can see that I have the model selected over here of H2, and yeah, we got H3, H6, so it'll even do the H6 now, which is very cool because I'll be reviewing one of those later on. And so we're gonna obviously stay with the H2. Mode is on, and you can see we are connected. So it all looks good here, and this is how we're going to adjust the forces in this window. Power's at 100% right now, which I'm probably going to back that off a bit, I imagine. We have smoothing at 50, boost at 35. 
and 20 across the board here for all of our pitch and roll yaw, but we're only going to be dealing with pitch and roll on this H2 platform. Motion test. So here is where we test and make sure everything's moving in the right directions. So I'm going to go with the pitch first and slide that up and down. Of course, uh, if I go up with it, that means it should tilt back. So let's see what happens. Well, I'm tilting back. <laughs> and if we go the other way, it should tilt forward. And yep, I'm tilting forward. All right. And the next thing we're going to test is the roll. I'm going to roll right first. Go up. Oh, I'm rolling right. <laughs> and then I'm going to come back and then roll left. All right. So what we have here now is everything is where it should be. Now, what we're going to do is go back to the motion section now. And what we'll do is go ahead and get in game. I'm actually going to go to, um, I'm going to use iRacing first. And then I may do a set of Corsa and possibly Project Cars too. I haven't decided yet just to see how everything goes as far as getting in here and actually driving this system. So that's what we'll do next. So here we are at Sebring and iRacing in the Ferrari 488 GT3, and we're getting ready to take the notorious Turn 17 at Sebring, where your suspension gets loaded up to the left, and you're hitting a lot of vicious bumps coming around that turn. Now, and again, one of the reasons I use Sebring for all my testing, especially in motion stuff, and you can see the movement there is not the smoothest, but again, I, I want to caveat everything I say here with the, you know, you have to manage our expectations here. This is a $1,200 system that has roll and pitch access and the whole platform's moving, which is a big plus here, having the whole platform moving. And it feels softer when you're sitting in it than it does when I'm sitting back here watching the video. And it's not as abrupt as it looks, I think. And one thing about this type of system, right off the bat, it uses the electric motors and the gearboxes. Even though we have much better motors, I think, and the gearboxes are much better as far as the quality control. As we saw in previously, the lash in the gearbox here is much closer in tolerance than the one on the M2 seat mover that I previously reviewed. That had a lot of movement in it. And it was it was jerky, you know, when it was moving. If you go back and look at the, the driving segment of that video, you'll see that. And I'm not saying this is the smoothest thing in the world either. It's not. And really when you're using electric motors and this has always been my opinion of it I, it's the nature of a we just call these wiper motors uh, a wiper motor motion system it doesn't have a very soft stop start function in these motors and gearboxes so it doesn't have a soft landing and it doesn't have like a delayed smooth uh, start when the motor goes in the other direction it's abrupt and although it is abrupt i think that the software that we're using here uh, Sim Racing Studio has done a great job in smoothing this out as much as they can, and it's still a lot smoother than that M2 experience. So they've come a long way, I think, as far as that goes. It's still, as you can see, not the smoothest thing. Actuators are smoother, but they have a soft start-stop uh, movement or motion inherent in those where, you know, it's, it's almost like a spring. And this is just abrupt, as you can see, when I'm going over some of those, those um, bumps there. But watch this straightway. They have a new feature here, SRS. And watch that. See that? I'm actually hitting the bumps in the straight here. And it's translating really well to the motion. And it's using using that boost slider. It really is, a, you're able to dial this in. And you can feel everything, really, on as far as texture goes. It's a really good texture uh, filter in there. And it's, you know, the transfer from asphalt to concrete going over your rumble strips, your sausage curbing, you know, all of that stuff is translated quite well, as you can see as I went up on the curb there. And they've done a great job with this Sim Racing Studio with this, this application. And I'm sure they've been working very hard on it to get it to where it is. Now, overall experience here is, again, we're, we're meeting expectation, I think. We're getting two axes of motion. Our whole platform is moving. You know, it's a lot different than when you have a seat mover. If you have a seat mover and you get in a, a chassis that everything moves with it, you know right away what the differences are. And yeah, you're not collapsing or being pushed against your steering wheel and your pedals when you brake, like you do in a seat mover, and you're not being pulled away from the wheel and the pedals like you do in a seat mover. Not that you can't live with that. I mean, you know, I've used a seat mover for a long time and was, was happy with it. But here it's different and because the whole chassis is moving. And again, $1,200 plus shipping to get, you know, two axes of motion, your whole platform moving. I think that 
like I said, it's meeting my expectations to what I've got here. And I think the dampers that we put on here are also helping smooth out some of the action here as far as movement. Now, the chassis itself is, it, it seems, everything is actually stiff. The pedal tray feels stiff when you're stomping on the pedals. The seat mount is stiff enough, but where it falls down is the, the wheel base uh, a bit. And, and again, that's meeting expectations too. I mean, you can just look at this assembly. You have the wheelbase mounted pretty high in the air from the mounting points of these square 20 millimeter tubes here. So you have to consider that too. And you can see it under heavy brake and you can almost see my it moving forward a little bit when I'm doing that. Now we're over in a set of Corsa to do some running over there. Uh, just so I could see how the motion translated there. And it was about the same. You know, the SRS app does a good job as, as far as picking up the telemetry and delivering the information to the controller that's make, you know making the motors move. So again, it is not the smoothest action in the world. It's, it can be considered abrupt in some situations, I think. But you know what? For the money, <laughs> and if you want to get into to motion and maybe you don't like motion or you're not sure if you want motion, this is not a bad deal, I think, to, to go out and spend $1,200 plus shipping and build this up and then get in it and, yeah, see what you think of motion. And then if you like it, then, you know, if budget, uh, <laughs> budget uh, if it allows, you can move up to something else. But as far as meeting expectations, I can pretty much confidently say that it does. It's a much better experience to me personally than what I was getting in that M2 seat mover. And again, if you go back and look at that footage of me driving that, you will see that. It even seems a little smoother here in a, in a set of Corsa than it was in iRacing. And that's because, well, number one, I'm in a smoother track. You know, Sebring is the devil when it comes to motion <laughs> as far as all the bumps and everything going on at that track. This is a much smoother experience here. So you don't see it moving as much. But again, overall, this is something I think that if, you know, you don't want to break the bank and you're on a budget, that something that you should look at. And maybe it's something that you might want to get and give a go. Again, at the, at the end of the day, you don't have a ton of money invested in it. I mean, you go to an actuator system from a system like this, and yeah, you're, you're, you're talking thousands of dollars, literally thousands of dollars more to get into an actuator system. And yeah, like I said, it's meeting expectations and, you know, it's worth a look if you're looking to get into some motion, I think. Right. So what we'll do now is just go ahead and get into the final thoughts. Final thoughts on the H2 motion platform from DOF Reality. After reviewing the M2 seat mover platform from DOF Reality, I came away thinking that it needed some improvements to how the motion was delivered. Now, this H2 platform, I was able to test the changes that DOF Reality has made. I have to say, they have certainly improved on their systems, with new motors that are 1500 RPM units instead of the former 3000 RPM motors that I originally tested here. The lash in the gearbox assemblies has also been made much tighter than the older gearboxes. And the gear ratios have been changed in those gearboxes from 1 to 50 to 1 to 25. There is a damper option available now, and my testing results seem to indicate that they are worth adding them to the H2. Putting the H2 together did take some time, but wasn't very difficult. With the only real drama of having to drill some holes in the pedal plate to accommodate the Thrustmaster pedal base I was using. And having to enlarge the mounting holes in the damper brackets to get the M10 bolts through them. The quality of the materials used in the H2 frame is about what I expected considering the price point of this assembly. The driving experience was much better than I had with the M2, with an overall smoother delivery of motion cues and the Sim Racing Studios controller software that is available for all the DOF Reality Motion platforms was a treat to use especially when compared to setting up and using a system with sim tools. <laughs> I ended up using a profile that Sim Racing Studios had on their website. Just a bit of tweaking got the motion to where I thought it felt best for this system. The driving experience has also improved a lot from when I reviewed the M2 seat mover a few months back. Overall, I think the H2 is a good unit for getting into a motion system without breaking the bank. I believe DOF Reality products are some of the least expensive out there right now, so definitely worth a look, I think. I'm Barry Rowland. Thanks again for watching the Sim Racing Garage channel. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. And if you would like to help support what I do here at the SRG, 
visit my website at simracinggarage.com.